Just a quick note, this week's episode is definitely PG-13. You know, I do wonder sometimes, I think that I maybe have had them in, in dreams. Hmm. What happens in dreams? I mean, it's such a hard thing to talk about, right? Because it's like, how do you describe it? Um, it's just that feeling of like a rush and a flush and a real like intense pleasure that feels like it, it has a, an end and a crest. There's a certain kind of pleasure that Catherine Smythe has never felt before. I had always sort of enjoyed sex and really liked sex, but I had never had an orgasm. What happens is that either the pleasure kind of really builds and builds and then plateaus and dissipates without any kind of real climactic moment, or it becomes a very painful sensation where I can't keep going because it hurts. It's just not the rapture or release that, you know, I imagine is what it must be like. Somewhere around 5 to 10 percent of women say they've never reached climax. It's considered a dysfunction called anorgasmia when it causes distress been linked to physical and psychological issues. And overall, straight women, like Catherine, say they reach climax during sex less often than others. I would talk to friends about it in the same boat. One friend, she was like, is there a chance that we actually have and we just don't realize it? Maybe orgasms aren't that great. (laughs) (laughs) She's like, I just don't think that could be it. At first, it didn't really feel to her like a problem. In my early 20s, men didn't really seem to care or notice. (laughs) (laughs) So I think because they weren't especially focused on it, I also didn't think that much about it. Until she fell in love. When I met my ex-husband, I I was so attracted, and I think vice versa, (laughs) that I, I suddenly became so frustrated because I was getting so close and not quite being able to to sort of, you know, <laughs> no pun intended, get over the hump. And so <laughs> that was my first foray into thinking like, oh, maybe I'm going to take active steps to do something about this. So this week, the story of a quest for orgasm that takes writer Catherine Smythe deep into a whole industry designed to solve her problem. A problem that's been a fixation of science, pseudoscience, philosophy, and politics for a very long time. I'm Julia Longoria. This is The Experiment. Somewhere in New York, newly in love with a man whose name we won't bother here to remember, a frustrated young writer, Catherine Smythe, 25 years old, set out to solve her body's problem. She started in a sensible place with a medical professional. The first person that I ever really spoke about it with seriously was this sex therapist, this sort of plump elderly woman, and she had a very tasteful office where everything was sort of gray and muted and hushed. What were you hoping to get from her? I mean, an orgasm, (laughs) really. (laughs) You know, she was just full of these really bonkers tips, like, you've got to eat more dark chocolate, you've got to go off birth control, you've got to start watching female-centric porn, You've got to be masturbating all day long. I'm going to write you a prescription for Viagra. Huh, Viagra? Viagra, yeah, for, for men. But the thing is, is I came home and I really did feel so energized. I started masturbating regularly. 
pretty girls do. Well, I do movies, and my friend's a model. She sent me home with these DVDs that were literally from, I want to say, like 1988. Yeah, you come over here and uh, sit down in front of the fire and play backgammon. That sounds great. I'm sorry. I just can't help it. Whenever I climax, I just start to sing. I don't know what comes over me. The outfits that these people were wearing were just ludicrous. It was acid wash jeans and like bleach blonde hair. And um, <laughs> so I watched those. I, I went off the pill. I, you know, took my Viagra. I actually didn't know women could, could take Viagra. Well, I mean, they can physically put it in their mouth. Right. And swallow it. <laughs> Does it do anything? What did it feel like? I did not notice any difference whatsoever. And so I did all these things. And yet, no luck. The thing is, like, it's exhausting and a little boring sometimes. And I just gradually lost interest and was like, you know what? I'm having great sex. I'm really happy with my sex life. Like, this isn't a problem I have to solve. For some women, success is possible with medical professionals, like therapists or pelvic floor specialists, but not for Catherine. She lived out the rest of her 20s, got married, and felt like she could live happily without climax. But then she got divorced. My marriage did end up ending, but not for anything to do with sex. She was 34 when she dipped her toe back in the dating pool. And the men she was dating wanted to help. Men, I guess, had gotten more, quote-unquote, enlightened, and it became very much something where they were like, did you, or how, you know, what, what do you like? Like, what can I do for you? There was this one guy, let's call him Chris. I thought that we were having this, like, really great sexual connection. But I was very honest about the fact that, that I didn't have orgasms. Um, he was kind of like, you know... I'm really bothered. For me, sex is goal-oriented, and I'm just not going to be able to enjoy it if you can't come. Like, I just don't feel like I can be with a woman who can't let go. If I'd been your husband, I would have had you seen the best sex therapist out there, which was really a, a line. And I, I got so upset, and I was kind of like, well, do you just understand? Like, I'm enjoying it. And if I'm enjoying it, and I'm having a great time, like, why can't you just kind of trust in that. But he was just like, you know, I think for me, it's it's kind of um, a deal breaker. And then another man, a guy she got pretty serious with, she thought she was going to marry him, told her, I know that if I married a woman who couldn't have an orgasm, I would cheat on her. What? And I was like, <laughs> what? <laughs> <laughs> You know, he was like, I think it's the closest connection that two human beings can share. And I was like, well, I mean, what does that mean? That 10% of women are just incapable of the closest human connection that two human beings can share? It's sort of like a weird view of intimacy as like this video game that you have to reach the high score. Rather. Well, and that's what he said. He was like, you know, he was like, I do. He was like, maybe there's a way that I could sort of see it as a challenge, like reaching a really high level in a video game. <laughs> he literally said he that. He literally said that, yeah. <laughs> Catherine's problem was back. And it felt bigger than before. Because this time, the men she wanted to be with wouldn't accept her for it. Oh my gosh, is this going to be some kind of existential threat to finding love? Maybe this means I'm undateable. You know, or maybe this means I'm un unlovable. It turns out that these men who were judging Catherine for her sexuality and her lack of pleasure... They come from a long line of such men. What became clear as I was reading up on this is that the female orgasm has been the subject of this like massive misinformation campaign <laughs> over the centuries. She went looking for the origin story. Well, so do you want to go way back, like to Aristotle? <laughs> or <laughs> Yes. Or actually, yeah. <laughs> Aristotle his two cents were that only women of a feminine type ejaculate and that, you know, women of more masculine appearance don't. Why would Aristotle feel like he needed to opine on this? <laughs> like, do you and that's actually been misquoted throughout the years where people thought that he said that only blondes ejaculate, but that's not true. He, he does talk about fair skin versus dark women, but not their hair color. 
<laughs> so <laughs> truly spectacularly <laughs> awful. <laughs> oh my god. Okay. <laughs> and so began a long tradition of myth making about women's bodies. It was really interesting to see how the female orgasm had been batted around by all these men over the centuries. And, you know, the metaphor that came to me is that it's kind of like a Rorschach's test, where it's this abstraction that all of these doctors and scientists are projecting their own worldview upon. And it's almost always to the benefit of men. For really most of history, people were basically under the impression that women's reproductive organs were the exact inverse of a man's, and that therefore women could only become pregnant if they orgasmed. And so up until 1730, it was just understood that if you had become pregnant, that you had therefore had an orgasm. And you would think that that would be to the medieval woman's advantage in that, like, the man would have to be kind of, like, paying attention to her needs, right? Yeah, an incentive to care. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but then it became kind of really convenient for rape apologists who would say that if you became pregnant, then it couldn't have been rape because, therefore, you must have enjoyed it. Unfortunately, versions of this myth are still with us. It seems to me, first of all, from what I understand from doctors... Uh, I don't know if you remember Todd Akin, a congressman who ran for Senate. He said... If it's a legitimate rape, uh, the female body has ways to try to shut that whole thing down. But let's assume that maybe that didn't work or something. You That's know, I, just left over from this belief. And thankfully that tanked his candidacy. Back to yesteryear. In the mid-1800s, finally, Western anatomists started to get some things right. They actually developed a sort of very detailed diagram of the clitoris. <laughs> it's very much not the inverse of the penis, as was originally thought. And the clitoris is like a really fascinating organ because it's the only human organ that is built solely for pleasure. You know, it has over 8,000 nerve endings but again, right, where you might think that, like, this sort of new knowledge about female anatomy would be good for females and for women and for progress. Now that the female orgasm wasn't necessary for procreation, it kind of was relegated along with female pleasure. So that by the 1850s, it was generally believed that women were actually incapable of climax. Incapable of climax are really just not particularly interested in sex at all. This all changed in the 1950s. Biologist Alfred Kinsey published survey data and found that women were quite interested in sex, even on their own. The revelation that 62% of American women had masturbated, which I think just like blew men's minds. <laughs> <laughs> I think that that was a big turning point. But I think what we've seen in the last 20 years is these sex help books for men where it's repositioning the female orgasm as something the kind of enlightened male has a real responsibility to his partner to facilitate these orgasms. Which again, seems like a good thing, right? Yeah, and I think for many women probably really is a good thing. Um, for, for women like me though, if the female orgasm was once seen as this sort of mythic thing, it's been now kind of recast as a compulsory thing. The female orgasm is basically kind of like, just like become like the primary purpose of sex in a way that's like made it very difficult for anyone who either like can't or doesn't want to orgasm. The female orgasm then becomes wrapped up in men's kind of virility and sense of honor. And then the, the female pleasure actually becomes kind of secondary. <laughs> yeah. So I started faking it. <laughs> Which is like <laughs> the obvious solution, right? Um, I guess I've seen enough movies where I was just like, you know, just do some like moaning. <laughs> Who knows, maybe I wasn't fooling anyone. <laughs> I don't know. 
No one likes the idea of faking it. But honestly, for me, I actually found it really empowering. For the first time, like, it just, this thing that had been an issue just wasn't an issue. And sex was so much more fun. It was so much less fraught. I felt like I was being seen for the first time the way that I saw myself. It wasn't anymore that I lacked something, right? It was suddenly like, oh, you know, here's what I have to offer as a sexual being. And again, I imagine orgasmic women are getting these responses all the time. But for me, that was a very new feeling. But after a while, faking it got old. It was a paradox. Because she started having more fun, it got more frustrating not to be able to reach a peak. And so began chapter two of her quest. I was like, I'm, you know, I want to, I want to kind of continue on that, that journey that I started with the sex therapist all those years ago. Where things got weird. So what did you do? So the first thing I did was I I made an appointment with a man named Dr. M. He is a sensual touch therapist. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know them. Classic, and, one of the paths in med school. Yeah, exactly. Internal medicine, sexual exactly. touch therapist. <laughs> um, you know, he's been featured in a bunch of different magazines and you send him an email and then you set up this time to meet. It's definitely a little like trepidatious, I would mm-hmm. say. Um, you know, find my friend, that like iPhone app. Mm-hmm. My best friend knew where I was. So I was like, if you don't hear from me in two hours. Like, <laughs> keep an eye on. Keep an eye on. <laughs> the little blue dot. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> she met Dr. M at a Starbucks. He was like, by the way, I'm not a real doctor. <laughs> so, <laughs> he was up front with that. Yeah, I was like, oh, I, I know. <laughs> don't worry. <laughs> he was a nondescript man who led her to his nondescript apartment. Total anodyne bachelor pad, brown leather couch, black Ikea bookshelves, Brooklyn Bridge poster. And he proceeded to give her a massage. And then he kind of like went, you know, down and like pulled apart my legs and just like, you know, was doing whatever he was doing down there. (laughs) He had said, don't focus on the orgasm. But every new sensation, I was kind of like, oh, is it happening? Is it happening? <laughs> <laughs> he was kind of like, well, we could do a little magic wand action. I was like, what's that? And he pulls out this like enormous white thing that looks like a cooking implement. And it was just like insane. <laughs> it was like the creme de la creme of vibrators. But again, I was like, ah, like I, I can't. I, it feels really good, but it's too painful. Again, no orgasm. I was getting dressed and and ready to go, and then he just held out his arms, and he was like, all right, big hug. (laughs) And I was just like, oh my gosh, you are just like someone's dad, which is, I guess, creepy, but but not in a creepy way. I think I left feeling hopeful. And with that hope, she began to look for more options. These friends were like, try this, try that. She was recommended new books. Come as you are. Therapists. The orgasm whisperer. She's like, orgasm is a skill, like skiing, right? Body sex workshops. Try hypnosis. I think that seems obvious. Betty Dodson workshop. A group of women sit naked in a circle and genital show and tell. (laughs) Millennial sex club parties. Like dominatrixes. That's the plural of dominatrix. I'm not sure. (laughs) Some of those men she dated even recommended things to her. Something called One Taste. A quote-unquote orgasmic meditation company, like $60,000 for a long membership. The O-Shot, have you heard of that? I have not heard of the O-Shot. What is the O-Shot? So basically what they do is they take blood from your arm, centrifuge it, and then the like platelet-rich plasma is then injected into your vagina. What? <laughs> Honestly, like, it felt so overwhelming and like confusing and and ultimately really bad 
The sex therapists, the gurus, the pseudo-doctors, they all presented different solutions to empower women to own their own sexuality and solve their own problem. But sifting through these options, she couldn't help but think back to the men that she dated. So I was kind of curious about all of these things, but then at the same time, I could also see that in a way, like they were kind of mimicking or or some kind of mirror of the men who were making me feel deficient. They were saying, there's this thing that we can help you fix. And implicit in that message is that there is something that needs to be fixed. This was the moment on her quest when she started to wonder if the problem she had was really her problem or a problem with the men she was dating. But, you know, they're always passing it off as if they are very enlightened or they're kind of feminists, right? Or they just care so much about pleasing women and really putting them first. I'm like, no, you're not putting them first. You're putting you first. (laughs) By this point, she thought about giving up. She didn't need to have an orgasm if ultimately it was about the men anyway. But then a friend of hers who was anorgasmic had one. A friend of mine texted me one day and she was like, you have to see this guy. I just had a full body lobster claw orgasm. And I like, I didn't even know what that was, but I was like, great. <laughs> like, sign me up. She saw a tantric healer named Justin. I, you know, made an appointment. I think his rate is $600. I had sent him a very lengthy intake form. My favorite question was like, do you love your genitals? Please describe. He shows up at my home and he's wearing black combat boots and like yellow and maroon Iket balloon pants and just a lot of amulet necklaces. He was like, okay, I'm going to go prepare the bedroom, like wrap yourself in this sarong and, uh, you know, make a list of your intentions. We had drawn the blinds and there were all these fake rose petals on the bed and incense, electric candles flickering everywhere. He just kind of like looks at me very solemnly and he says, enter goddess. (laughs) I was just like, oh gosh, okay. Here we go. You're laughing now, but like in the moment, what was going through your head? Were you like trying to really like engage and and be present or were you kind of like not able to stop laughing? Like I can't, I can't take Gata seriously. Like I just can't. (laughs) So I really was keeping an open mind and, and, you know, but, but I was just like, this is very silly. We did have a a conversation about boundaries where he was like, so before we start, you know, do you have any boundaries? And I was kind of like, I don't think so. (laughs) You don't know? And he was kind of like, okay, well, how would you feel about um, unprotected penetrative sex? And I was kind of like, whoa. (laughs) Oh, no, yes, that that is a boundary. You're right. (laughs) I don't want that. But, you know, but then we kind of, like, sat on the bed, like, cross-legged and looked into each other's eyes. And he, and he was like, okay, like, you know, breathe very deeply. In through your nose and out through your mouth. I lay down on my stomach. He, like, took off the sarong, so I was totally naked. And then all of a sudden, rubbing my back. And, and, then, all, and then I'm like, oh, gosh, he is also naked. <laughs> Which I was not necessarily expecting. And I was just like, oh, my God, what? What have I done? <laughs> like, like, what did I just tire myself prostitute? Like, what is this? Nibbling on my earlobes. You are strong. You are worthy. Lovable. Sexy. He took all this lavender oil. Imagine the farm where this lavender was grown. The factory where it was turned into oil. The farmer who picked it. Imagine his life. Imagine his the world is performing for you. And you don't even know it a lot of attention, like, lavished upon what he called my sacred temple. (laughs) So for the next, you know, half hour, maybe longer, we just kind of lay there naked and entwined, and he was just, like, telling me all about his first tantra experience and how revelatory it had been, and he had, like, quit his finance job and sold his fancy car and moved, actually, to Miami. 
to, you know, focus on healing women like myself. And I was just like, oh, no, like I didn't hire a prostitute. Like I I hired myself a boyfriend. <laughs> he was kind of like, you know, what did you think? And And I was like, it was interesting. It was good. Like, you know, I enjoyed it. But an orgasm that she did not have. He was shocked that I hadn't had an orgasm. He texted me later and asked how I was feeling. And, and I think what I said disappointed him because he, he then texted me back and was like, you know, there, there might be a lot more revelations here than you're kind of allowing yourself to realize. And, and I think your journey is really just beginning. Over the course of her quest, Catherine tried a dozen different interventions. Things that really can work for some women, but not for her. And the thing is, she continued to enjoy sex just fine most of the time. She couldn't help but think that Justin the Tantra Keeler was no better than Aristotle and all the people personally offended that she couldn't reach a peak. And the other thing that I should say is, like, I also get it. I have dated some men who themselves have had trouble orgasming, Mm -hmm. and I get why that can feel bad or make you feel like you're not enough or that... Like it's about you. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I so, so it's not like I don't understand, but I also just think to make it a deal breaker. The orgasm is such a small part of, of sex. Th- there is like what an orgasm actually is and then there's like the myth of, <laughs> of the orgasm which sort of towers over it. Have you experienced an orgasm through all of the, this journey? Oh. Uh, No, I don't think so. I I actually, I am now dating someone and have been for for the past year um, who is like the most lovely and generous man. And, you know, we have like a really great sex life and it's not at all a problem for him. Maybe I I do want to continue this journey, but it's like if I am going to continue it, it's, it's for myself. It's not for someone else. This episode was produced by Julia Longoria and me, Gabrielle Berbe, with editing by Katherine Wells. Fact check by Steph Hayes. Sound design by David Herman. Music by Tasty Morsels and Nelson Nance. Our team also includes Tracy Hunt, Natalia Ramirez, and Emily Botin. And a special shout out to teammate and founding producer of the experiment, Alvin Belleth. This is Alvin's last week on the show. He's off to chase his radio dreams. Alvin, thank you, and we'll miss you. If you liked this week's episode, please be sure to rate and review us on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen. The Experiment is a co-production of The Atlantic and WNYC Studios. Thanks for listening. <laughs>